Uh, thank you all for attending today's hearing. I think it's an important one and is, is to look at the potential relationship between psychiatric medications and suicides. I want to introduce the first panel. It's, uh, we have Dr. Peter Bregan, a psychiatrist and author from Ithaca, New York. Please uh, enlighten us. You have the floor. Well, I am Peter R. Bregan, uh, MD. I'm a psychiatrist, and I was in this area of D.C. for most of my career, and then we moved to Ithaca, New York, to be in the country. In the early 1990s, I became the first psychiatrist to speak and write extensively uh, about violence and suicide caused by the newer antidepressants, beginning with Prozac, later going on to Paxil, Zoloft, Celexa, and other drugs. I also, as a result of that early research, became the scientific expert for more than 100, I think it was like 170 cases that were combined uh, by a court to provide the opportunity for one person to research the data and look into the company files for all of the suits. And I was chosen to be that one medical expert. This ended up giving me experience that literally no one else in, in the world has had in terms of looking at the basic data from Eli Lilly and then from some other drug companies. Uh, I was shocked at what I found inside the company. Uh, for example, the German uh, equivalent of our FDA had become concerned that uh, they were finding an increased suicide rate uh, on studies of Prozac. So they asked Eli Lilly, and this is back now uh, in the late 80s, to go back and look at all of their clinical trials and report to them on the rate of suicide attempts in the controlled clinical trials with the drug versus placebo. Lilly found, depending on how you counted, a 6 to 12 to 1 ratio of suicide attempts, not just thinking, attempts, in the, the uh, control group compared to placebo. Lilly never made it public. They never gave this report that I found to the Germans. They never made it available to the FDA. I also found uh, memos inside Lilly explaining guilt and shame on the part of some German uh, investigators for Lilly that the company was classifying suicides and suicide attempts reported by doctors to them as no drug effect or other harmless kinds of entities, thereby disguising the suicide attempts and the completed suicides. And one of these memos, the, the gentleman uh, declared, um, how am I going to explain this to my family? It was a gen genuine shame. At the same time, the FDA conducted a study comparing um, uh, Prozac to an older antidepressant, Trazodone, and factoring in the increased number of prescriptions for Lilly, for Prozac, and also factoring in the controversy, because the controversy hadn't broken out yet, there were far more reports of suicidality, of violence, and other mental adverse effects on Prozac. I worked on these issues for many, many years, as you know, and then uh, testified before the FDA in 2004 on a couple of occasions. And the agency distributed one of my papers written in 2003 to the panel, the FDA panel, and a lot of the language in the current label uh, uh, virtually reads um, like many, actually very, very similar to uh, what I had to say in these um, in my papers and books. Now, my conclusions in this testimony are based not only on these very early uh, studies that I discovered inside of Eli Lilly, which, by the way, you can find on my website, the Lilly documents I'm describing, and I describe them in a couple of my books. But my uh, conclusions are based in part on the many citations in the paper I wrote specifically for this committee. I actually sat down and wrote your paper. Antidepressant-induced suicide and violence, risks for military personnel, and in the hundreds of citations in my book. My recent book, which Mr. O was kind to mention, and which I know that uh, you have read, Mr. Chairman, Medication Madness, uh, gives an overview of my clinical experience, which now included in the book 
more than 50 cases of violent suicide and crime, most of them on antidepressants. And I actually, I actually interviewed survivors. I actually went to crime scenes, read all the medical records, police records, and clearly documented medication madness from a clinical viewpoint that there are many, many cases like this. I actually have over 100 that are mentioned in the book and 50 documented in detail. In 2004, after the various hearings, the F, or actually before them, required the antidepressant manufacturers to review their clinical trials. The FDA itself concluded that the newer antidepressants double the rate of suicidal thoughts and behaviors in children, youth, and young adults up to age 24, which of course is very menacing for the soldier population, the military population. Now, you get a doubling of rates. Well, what does this mean? Well, the clinical trials are very short. Most of them average about six weeks. Some of the Prozac trials were four weeks. Suicidal patients are excluded from clinical trials. The patient is monitored every week by experts and informed of all the dangers, presumably. And the patient is given huge hope. You are, you're in this wonderful uh, research setting where, where you're getting something new and wonderful. And furthermore, there's no attempt to look for suicide attempts and to categorize them. Now, when you get a doubling of suicide under those conditions, I'm sorry, suicide attempts and ideation, under those conditions, you can assume that in the military or clinical practice it's going to be multiples, unknown multiples, because there it's given for months, there it's not monitored, their psychotic patients are included, their suicidal patients are included, and all of that's excluded from the clinical trials. Now, one of the questions that may come up today is that there were in this particular batch of trials no completed suicides. The shock is how many attempts there were because the best way to treat suicide, if there were one, would be to simply put somebody in a clinical trial and give hope because suicide is loss of hope. And that's, that's why when you get all the doctors looking at you and testing you and uh, working with you, you almost never get suicides in any kind of clinical trial of that kind. Now, the FDA warnings that came out of these hearings are identical for all antidepressants. The Zoloft label is the model I'm going to use. And it begins with a huge black box, huge black box, very rare thing, with the title Suicidality and Antidepressant Drugs. And I'll read you just the first line of it. Antidepressants increase the risk compared to placebo of suicidal thinking and behavior, parentheses suicidality, in, adolescent, in children, adolescents, and young adults in short-term studies of major depressive disorder and other psychiatric disorders. And later in the label, they'll say that, that a lot of the adverse effects occur in non-psychiatric patients. This black box is very lengthy. And many of the items are repeated over and over again. It's the only label like that that I know of. The black box is followed by a very ominous section, still in the warnings, entitled Clinical Worsening and Suicide. This idea of clinical worsening that's repeated in the label is um, not given enough attention. It states in this section that the following symptoms I'm going to list quote, have been reported in children and adults taking antidepressants, both for psychiatric and non-psychiatric purposes. And the list includes anxiety, agitation, panic attacks, insomnia, irritability, hostility, aggressiveness, impulsivity, akathisia, which is psychomotor restlessness, and the DSM-4, our, our major document, points out that akathisia leads to violence and suicide. So I interrupted. Akathisia, hypomania, and mania. And mania is an out-of-control state that increases vastly the risk of violence and suicide. Um, this is the list that's virtually taken from several of my public, earlier publications. And note the mention of irritability, hostility, aggressiveness, and impulsivity. Imagine causing that in young men and women who are heavily armed and under a great deal of stress. 
And uh, irritability, hostility, aggressiveness, impulsivity not only lead to violence, but to suicide. Many suicides are out of anger and irritability and resentments. Dr. Bregan, if I, I, I don't mean to interrupt, I just want to ask a specific question. If, a, say, an active duty soldier is given this, these medications, they may not even see that warning, right? I mean, uh, well, my experience, last year I spoke at the, um, the oldest military stress conference, uh, given uh, Bart Billings, uh, whom you know, uh, retired army officer and psychologist, uh, runs that. And I talked to generals and I talked to mental health professionals, and they all agreed that these warnings uh, were hardly ever presented to the soldiers and that the army was, in a sense, acting as if it was unaware and uh, some of these people gave me estimates, not of the 15% on psychiatric drugs that we often hear, but up to 30% of soldiers in some sections, Marines in particular, was one that was mentioned to me. So they're not even informed of the risks? No, no. And, it, and uh, as we go on further, we'll see that the FDA tells doctors you should, and the word should is in the label, you should share this information with the patient and the family and make sure they understand it. It's not just you repeat it to them. You sort of, you know, hey, this is, I want you to understand, this is what may happen to you. So I do in my clinical practice. I don't say, by the way, the drug may cause this or that. You know, I just make sure over a period of many sessions that the person understands the risks. Now, in it, did I answer the question, sir? In, in addition to this, um, this list that's uh, associated with the drug itself, um, the antidepressants, and this is mentioned in the label and in, and in the, um, mentioned in the uh, medication guide I'll tell you about, the antidepressants often cause severe withdrawal reactions in which all of those symptoms, all of those adverse reactions can develop. In fact, I spend probably half my practice, even in remote Ithaca, treating people who come to me to try to get off of these drugs and are suffering violent feelings, suicidal feelings. And in fact, in the last three weeks, I've had at least three or four patients who, as we went down lower on their doses, uh, developed really, really frightening reactions. And then I had to treat those, usually by raising the dose back up for a while. Let me, um, let me mention some of the science more specifically bef uh, at this point, this list of, of, of uh, mania and hypomania and agitation and aggression and so on, that list in one FDA document is stated to be a known effect, this whole series that I read to you, a known effect of the drugs. And what I'm going to read to you now involves mostly uh, controlled clinical trials or epidemiological studies. No one should be able to say that causality has not been demonstrated. The gold standard for causality is the control clinical trial, and it shows a doubling of the rate of suicidality. That's the gold standard. And I have a discussion that's, re that's documented between the top members of the FDA agreeing at the hearings that unless somebody's cheating or there's some other malfeasance going on, when you have a causal association in controlled clinical trials, and I would add they weren't discussing this, epidemiological studies, that's causality. In addition, federal regulations say that the warnings label must have a reasonable degree of certainty about causality before it gets put into the label. Um, an overview of some of the studies that are, that are involved, because I want you to know this, is, this isn't, you know, my personal opinion. This is what the science has overwhelmingly taught me, starting with my looking inside the drug companies. The, in addition to the studies done under the auspices of FDA, we have, uh, and this is for children and adults, we have a study by Orsnes, A-U-R-S-N-E-S, -E in 2005. He looked at 16 placebo-controlled clinical trials in which Paxil was randomized against placebo and found increased suicidal behavior. Uh, the references are in the article that I gave to you, as well as my books. 
Uh, Ferguson in 2005 searched the adult literature, found 702 randomized clinical trials with 87,000 patients and found a significant increase in suicidality on antidepressants. Donovan in 1999 in a large British study involving 229 completed suicides, it's a big study in England, found a higher suicide rate in patients treated with the newer antidepressants. Donovan in 2000 examined 2,776 consecutive cases of deliberate harm in individuals aged 17 and older, not children, 17 and older, like soldiers, seen at the emergency department of a British infirmary. Again, again the suicide rates were increased in uh, people taking the newer antidepressants. A fellow named Zick, Jick, J-I-C-K, in 1995, conducted an epidemiological study in the United Kingdom involving 172,000 adult patients, and Prozac was associated with more suicides than the older antidepressants. In my home state, for many years of Maryland, Frankenfeld and some very respected researchers at the University of Maryland studied coroner's cases at Maryland and found the suicides were more violent, which is my clinical experience, in patients taking Prozac compared to older antidepressants. Now, GlaxoSmithKline in 2006, the manufacturer of Paxil, conducted a new meta-analysis of all its adult trials. The FDA said, you got to do a meta-analysis of all the adult trials and found a statistical increase in the rate of suicidality in depressed patients of all ages. An increased rate from the clinical studies, their own, which were not oriented toward this, an increased statistically significant rate, all ages, in patients with major depressive disorder. It's in a Dear Doctor letter that they sent out to all the healthcare, it's really now called a healthcare, a healthcare letter, to all healthcare professionals in the country. Uh, a study of uh, 1,255 suicides in 2006 in Sweden found that, uh, which was 95% of all the suicides in Sweden, um, by Le Jung and all, uh, L-J-U-N-G, this, this is 2009, found that uh, there was a greatly increased number of su completed suicides exposed to... Um, the antidepressant drugs. In fact, 52% of the Scandinavian women uh, who killed themselves had filled in a prescription for these drugs. Now, this is not as causal as the clinical trials. It could be other factors, but it's just part of this mountain, mountain of evidence. A retrospective study examined the suicide rate in the VA of involving a cohort, a group of people of, that were um, 887,000. That's six digits, 887,000 VA patients treated for depression and found, quote, completed suicide rates were approximately twice the base rate following antidepressant starts in VA clinical settings. That's Valenstein and all in 2009. Now, again, you can, you can look at something like this and say, well, maybe the worst patients were put on the antidepressants and that's the correlation. That's not what they concluded and, of course, this now comes against the backdrop of the clinical trials, which show causality. Jurlink, J-U-U-R-L-I-N-K, at all in 2006, reviewed more than 1,000 cases of actual suicides in the elderly and found that during the first month of treatment with SSRIs, there was a five-fold increase in risk in the elderly. This is no surprise because the elderly are more susceptible to adverse effects. Fisher et al., in a really interesting study, uh, got, did a phone survey of people who went to a pharmacy and got drugs, medications, and found that there was a higher rate of suicidality in people who got the SSRIs compared to other antidepressants. I don't think there's a question about causality, although some people will raise questions of causality today, I'm sure. Finally, just to look at the literature on mania, uh, because... Mania, mania, if you read the dsm 4 is commonly caused by antidepressants. This is in our diagnostic manual, that all of the phenomena of mania are caused by antidepressants, as well as by just simply bipolar disorder. And 
Mania results in suicide, violence, crime. I've had a, a whole bunch of just dreadful cases like that. Well, in 2001, PREDA, P-R-E-D-A, found that 8.1% of adult psychiatric admissions could be attributed to antidepressant-induced mania and psychosis. 8% hospital admissions. Another group found that 8% of patients treated with Paxil developed mania. In other words, they're, they're not even looking for it. They go back and they look at records and they find that 8% of the patients got mania when the drug was started. Causality has been definitely uh, established in studies uh, like this. Um, Howland in 1996, again, found a 6% rate. Look at these rates, 6, 8, very, very consistent of SSRI-induced mania. To induce mania in a soldier, in an armed young man or woman, is an incredibly risky affair. Ebert et al. in 1997 found a 17% rate of hypomania in patients on SSRIs. Some were suicidal and dangerous. Martin used a national database of 7 million privately insured individuals, and he found that if you look at people given antidepressants, all of a sudden they're getting bipolar disorder diagnoses afterward, after the antidepressants. I could go on and on, but I, I won't. I want to tell you one more study, because this one comes out of the heart of the advocacy group for psychiatric drugs. It comes from uh, Harvard Medical School, where... Uh, most of what they do is financed, or much of it, by the drug companies, and where most of the prominent doctors, uh, recently under investigation by Senator Grassley, for taking money from the drug companies and not informing people. Well, they did a study. This is Weiland's et al., 2003, of adverse psychiatric events on children taking these drugs, children and adolescents, and, and they're just more susceptible than adults, but it's the same phenomena. And they found that 22% had adverse psychiatric events, quote, most commonly related to disturbance of mood. Then they did something that's called a re-challenge. We got a few studies like that, this. A re-challenge is where somebody develops a symptom like suicidality. You stop the drug, the symptom goes away. You restart the drug, the suicidality comes back, you stop the drug, it goes away. Rothschild did a study like this, uh, not even in this paper, but uh, in, uh, you can find it in my books. Um, the FDA says that this is a very, very good thing to do. Well, um, in this case, when they re-exposed the children to an SSRI, 44% of that group again became disturbed. And what did they develop? The things we've been hearing about. They became irritable, anxious, manic. They developed insomnia. 4% of the children became aggressive. Uh, Dr. Bergen, I, I, I need you I'll to finish up, now. finish up right now. Okay, thank I you. I really appreciate this time to share with you my, my work and the literature. Now, under... Uh, under FDA regulations, I want to talk about efficacy very briefly. The pharmaceutical companies can cherry pick their studies. They can do six or eight studies and just provide two that are marginally effective, statistically significant to the FDA. It's not hard when you are purchasing the investigators and writing the protocols for them and then in analyzing the data inside the drug company for the companies to develop positive studies, but it's still hard. And when all of the antidepressant studies that are done, not just the cherry-picked ones, are combined in a meta-analysis, the antidepressants are no better than placebo. Now, as you may discover today, psychiatric associations and other groups that rely heavily on financial support are going to try to reject and deny all this. In conclusion, there is overwhelming evidence that the newer antidepressants commonly prescribed in the military can cause or worsen suicidality, aggression, and other dangerous mental states. The documented increase in suicides in the military, as well as any discovered, and I hope you will look into this, uh, Mr. Chairman, dis any discovered increase in random violence among soldiers is in part caused or exacerbated by the widespread use of prescriptions for uh, antidepressants. Finally, little will be lost and much will be gained by curtailing the prescription of antidepressants in the military. 
The military instead should rely upon newly developed psychological and educational programs, many of which are being implemented, and which Dr. Bart Billings, who is familiar to this committee, has written about in his report to the committee, including his heart program. Thank you very, very much for the time. Thank you so much uh, for that. Uh, it's rather chilling. <laughs>